you don't want to cut to a point where you don't have time to have staff meetings, to have staff education, to allow people to have their vacations and go out on leave, what have you. You have to build that into the number. Clock in, scrub up, and join us behind the red line. You're listening to First Case, a perioperative podcast bringing you exciting interviews, engaging discussions, and innovative solutions that are changing the way patients receive surgical care. Each episode, we talk to frontline staff, perioperative leadership, and nursing entrepreneurs from across the country as they share their stories, experience, and expertise on the industry we love. From the back table to the boardroom, from wheels in to wheels out, we tackle the real-life issues affecting the OR. Whether you're tuning in for a surgical service education or inspiration, we're glad you're here. And now, it's time to roll back and start the first case. This week on First Case, we speak with Paul Wafer, who is a host here at First Case. But today, we're going to flip the script, and he's going to be a guest on the show. And he's going to be talking about his extensive experience at many different levels within healthcare, specifically surgical services. And we're going to be talking about productivity, which I think everybody is familiar with the term, but maybe not everybody knows exactly what goes into being effective and making changes around productivity and trying to achieve that perfect sweet spot where you are getting the most out of the staff without burning them out, Jeremy. Yeah, Justin, I'm interested to hear what Paul has to say. I struggled with this as a manager. It was something that was mysterious to me coming in, and it took a while to learn how the productivity measures were developed. And I'm, I'm just interested to get Paul's take on it. I've never actually spoken with a, a true consultant in the OR about productivity, so it'll be interesting to hear his take on it. All right. Well, let's just get right into it. We're going to be right back with Paul Wafer after a short break. Hi, I'm Paul Wafer. I'm Melanie Perry. I'm Jeremy gibson Roar. And I'm Justin Poulin. A 17 Studios production, you're listening to First Case. Joining us now is our very own Paul Wafer. And Paul, I know we got into your, actually all of our backgrounds on our inaugural episode, episode one. So I'm not sure that you need to go through the background and history of your experience other than to say that the reason we're doing this interview with you tonight is to talk a lot about productivity. And I do want to remind all of our listeners uh, who may or may not have listened to that first episode that you've really had a great deal of experience all the way from just the front lines all the way up to the top and being a CEO of a hospital. And so when you talk about productivity tonight with us, I'm pretty sure that you're going to define it in multiple different ways to really hit different levels of experience, not just granular and at the aggregate level, but just why does it matter and what can effective productivity, you know, really do for hospitals. And so we're going to break it all down today. And I want to say thank you for coming on the show, but you're always on the show. <laughs> well, well, thank you, Justin. And, you know, I find that productivity is a very important subject. And there's a lot of misunderstanding about what it really is, especially at the staff level, but even at the management level, they think it's a number that they just have to meet. And they don't really know all of the intricacies that can be involved in productivity. And my role in consulting, many times, this is an area where I was actually hired by other firms to come in as a subject matter expert and help hospitals determine what the right productivity level should be in the whole perioperative space. So I'm hoping to educate a little bit and, and help people to understand why it's important and what are the things to look for when you're not being able to meet your numbers the way the hospital wants you to. So 
I got to think that when you first started an engagement around that conversation, that you really had to set the context for productivity. Maybe you even gave it a different definition so that you could frame it in a new light so that you could really get to the heart of what you were trying to accomplish while you were working with the hospital. Am I right about that? And how did you define productivity? Well, productivity is just really a way to measure how much work is being done whether it's in the operating room or recovery room or in the pre-op clinic, sterile processing, what you want to be able to do is identify what the amount of work is that's necessary to meet a standard workload. And and that's where it gets a little tricky sometimes because the the workload definition can change, the people that are involved in a particular department may vary in terms of which levels of staff are in it. So what you want to do is make sure that whatever standard you're developing, you're doing it in a way that is consistent with the target you're trying to meet and whoever you're being compared to. So Paul, I got to feel like sometimes when people hear that that word productivity, it makes them wince. You know, maybe they don't want to be measured or maybe they're afraid of what that measurement is. Do you think it really comes from what you just said? The fact that the standard may not be an, uh, a good standard or it's not an equal standard necessarily that you're measuring against and and that maybe that maybe that standard of work is is somehow not reflective of the true picture? Well, I, I think we have to look at the history of how it was developed and from where it started to where it is now. Because if you look at what most hospitals have as their standard, for example, in the operating room, it hasn't changed that much from the early 1990s to today. And if you think about the amount of work that goes on in an operating room today, versus the early 1990s with all the equipment and computers and specialty devices that happen in cases nowadays compared to then. And you're still trying to do with that same number of hours worked per minute of surgery time or per hour of surgery time. It's got to be crazy difficult for hospitals to be able to do that. And I think that that's why people resent productivity. They don't like it because they think it's making them work too hard. But if you do it the right way and you use the right comparisons and look at all the workflows and processes associated with a particular area, you can come up with a number that is achievable and not punitive in any way, but it's not easy. So what's the best way to come up with that number? How do you come up with what's an effective level of productivity? What's keeping your employees working and keeping them getting paid, but also not messing with your bottom line? Well, there are several ways to make sure that you're meeting a standard that is efficient, but also allowing your staff to not get upset and leave. And, you know, there are a number of companies out there that have developed standards. And in those standards, they have multiple types of facilities that they can compare you to, like by case mix or by number of operating rooms or urban or rural, what departments are included and which ones are excluded. And that's just a starting point. So you might start with that, like say a, a 300 bed hospital in a, in a suburban community that does a thousand cases a month. That might be the criteria that is used to determine what standard you're going to be looking at to try and meet. And what hospitals will generally do is they'll say, well, we want to be in the 50th percentile. We want to be in the top 25 percent, what have you. So, but that's only part of the part of the picture because what can happen is you can be in that 
300 bed hospital with a thousand cases a month but you might not be doing any open hearts you might not be doing any neuro you might not be doing any total joints or spine it depends on the case mix as well it also depends on what people are counted in your FTEs in your department. For example, a few weeks ago we had Dan Fister on and he was talking about the materials management team should be the ones who are restocking the shelves in the operating room. And when that occurs, then those FTEs or those people that are doing that restocking show up in the materials management cost center. But there's a lot of operating rooms that have their own staff restocking those shelves. And those personnel, that work, is being done by OR staff, and they're being counted in the OR's productivity. So you have to feather through all that stuff and find out who is doing what in a department. And that's kind of what I did. I would look at the workflows of all the departments in the perioperative service and determine, okay, your materials people are in your department. We've got to move those out and change the standard or keep the standard where it is, but get those people out of there to make it easier for you to make the, the target. So is it better to benchmark yourself against yourself than it is to try to figure out how you fit into these productivity percentiles across the country? I'll give you a little background on how I learned productivity in the eight, 1980s, I worked at a small OR, four-room OR, and it was probably one of the very first productivity systems called Rescue OR, where we had to look at hours work per case. Then I went to a very big corporate nonprofit hospital, but they had a department within their multi-hospital system called Resource Evaluation. And in resource evaluation, they had all these management engineers that would come to your department, talk to you about your workflows and your processes. They would do time studies and everything else and measure what your standard should be. But it was never compared to anybody else. They just established a standard for you. It wasn't until I went to work for a for-profit hospital chain where they tried to compare against all their hospitals. This was like an 80 hospital system. They would try to compare their productivity levels between all of them. But even with that, not even all the hospitals within that system measured things the same way. So it, it's always a challenge. You really have to know what you're comparing to. So, Paul, I have a question about how often you think that this productivity number should be revisited. So one of the challenges that I had when I managed the OR was that this productivity number was a consulting firm came into our facility. They looked at our body of work. They gave us a productivity number per surgical hour. That's what we were supposed to meet. Well, I come in two and a half years later and... When I look at the productivity number and the the case volume, like you mentioned, we had shifted quite a bit of volume to total joints and neuro and away from general surgery, which doesn't I mean, that that's a great thing for the hospital, right? But it does impact staffing because I have to throw an additional surgical tech into a total joint room with our total joint surgeons. So can you talk to us about you know how, how often that should be revisited? Should it be an annual thing, biannual? to make sure it's still appropriate. You're right on there, Jeremy. That's one of the big issues. So that's what's incumbent upon the director of a department to understand that that change in case mix is going to have some impact. So if that consulting firm a few years ago said that this is the number that it needed to be and they gave you that target, I, I would have a few questions. First of all, did they just give you a target or did they work with you and tell you what workflows you could change to improve your efficiency? Because that's one of the things I always did. You know, I would say, okay, you need to change how you prepare a patient for the OR. You know, uh, maybe the staffing needs to be different or the process needs to be different in order to become more efficient. So that's part of it. 
if your case mix is changing, that's where it's good to keep track of your statistics and know that your volume of joints are going up or your spines or what have you are going up. That's where you justify increasing your productivity number because, look, I've got more staff that's needed now because of X, Y, and Z. That number has to go up. Yeah, and I think you make a great point. This consulting firm came in and they did every department in the hospital. And that was their goal was to come in and, and set productivity numbers for every department in the hospital. And I think that what's often overlooked is the benefit of changing the workflows, not just setting this arbitrary number, but also looking at workflows and how those can be improved more granular in nature. And and let, let me just say one other thing about these the companies that come in and look at the whole hospital. Many of them uh earn their profit or they make more money if they're able to save the hospital more money. They'll get a percentage of whatever they identify as savings based on improved productivity at the hospital. So there's pressure on those companies to cut as much as they possibly can. And when I would work for those companies, that's one of the things I would push back. I'd say, no, Uh, you know, they'd say, well, can you get three or four more FTEs out of there? And and I would say no, because you don't want to cut to a point where you don't have time to have staff meetings, to have staff education, to allow people to have their vacations and go out on leave, what have you. You have to build that into the number. So it's really a, a key issue that needs to be in focus at all times. You know, I think, too, when these when the consulting firms come in, sometimes it feels like they're only looking at the staff as numbers on a page and they're not looking at them sometimes as people. Like you said, you know, remembering that we need lunch breaks and we need people there to cover vacations and staff meetings. But I wonder sometimes, too, when we've had them come in before, whether or not the consultants I mean, I know you had OR experience as a consultant, but it doesn't seem like they always do when they're evaluating an OR I mean, shouldn't the person evaluating the productivity of an OR understand how an OR works? You're you're absolutely right, Melanie. That's another issue that we come across as well. A lot of these consulting firms will go out and hire fresh MBAs out of programs with no experience, no healthcare experience at all. But the good firms hire people like me that are subject matter experts in a particular area and are able to discern what is actual versus not achievable. And, you know, there can be so many factors. You could have just the the layout of the department can have an impact on how efficient you are. You know, when you have a 40-room OR that's spread over a half a mile and people have to run a quarter mile to get to the supply room, it's going to impact their ability to do things efficiently. So you've got to take all that into consideration when you're looking at productivity. That really goes back to the Daniel Fister interview that we did, you know, talking about letting supply chain come in and handle, you know, a good amount of that, because that would actually tease it out. As you said earlier, Paul, depending on the structure of the OR, that would really tease out some of that. I just, you know, it's non-clinical work in, in many cases, And you might be able to get a more standard set of productivity metrics that way. When you have hybrid and blended roles, like you said, I think the term you used was feathering through it. I can see how difficult that would be. Would that be considered for you a best practice? Would it be to tease those out consistently? Because, you know, there's always some people that are in the department that are like, you know, they're a go-getter. And they're like, I'm going to go take care of that because this has to get done now. And it might impact their productivity, but they might also be helping make a system that isn't efficient still run and kind of meet the need, right? So, you know, having clear roles in the department has got to be part of that best practices. Well, I think part of what you're alluding to is the fact that in many departments, when you go in, they've developed workarounds to bad practices or bad processes. And because of those workarounds, they're less efficient. So what you have to do is point out those workarounds and say, look, 
you're doing double the work you need to do because you're doing X, Y, and Z. If you just do A and B instead, you'll solve that problem and you'll, you won't have to work as hard. So yes, that's, that's part of it. Yeah, feathering out the other roles is also important. But, you know, some of these companies that, that develop these standards, they might have an OR where something is included or something is excluded. They may have examples of both. So if as long as it's the right example with your hospital and it's determining which is the right example to go by is where it becomes key to how you're doing. So, Paul, one of the areas that we struggled with was our, our non-revenue generating departments, such as sterile processing, that also impact productivity. We had a, a basically an FTE number, really not a product productivity number, just an FTE number. So they really didn't look at the processes down there. Can you talk a, bit, a little bit about what the best practice is in looking at some of those departments that impact the OR? Oh, it's, it, you know, SPD is all over the map in terms of how uh, productivity is determined historically and i'm going back my 40 years here historically sterile processing was part of central supply right you had your materials in your your linen room and all that stuff and when it was like that they used adjusted patient days for determining the workload in central supply well that work standard didn't really change at a lot of hospitals over the years. And there's still hospitals today that use adjusted patient days for determining the productivity standard in sterile processing. Some hospitals have changed now to cases. And cases is better than adjusted patient days. But you still have the issue with, are you doing 10 DNCs? Or are you doing 10 total joints? And the amount of workload that goes along with that is much greater in one area versus another. So it's really important to really look at, I think the, the, the key metric for serial processing should be trays. And I know that there's uh, some hospitals that go so far as to give the trays an acuity standard so that some trays have a longer processing time than others. You need to have a good instrument management system to be able to do that. But I think that's where it's going. And, you know, and if you have an instrument management system, then you can automatically generate a report that can go to the hospital productivity system to help determine, you know, what the real workload is. But even in, even doing that, there's other pieces of work that occur in sterile processing, building the case carts, having to run for trays, answering phone calls, things like that. Those are all pieces of work that need to be accounted for when you're in that department. And some of them manage non-acute departments like pumps and things like that that get, you know, way out of the scope for one SPD versus another one. Absolutely. You know, another area where that that's a big issue is if you look at the whole process of pre-admission testing to pre-op the day of surgery to recovery and secondary recovery, I like to to break it down into two parts. You know, the recovery room is pretty much staffing per m minute or per hour in the recovery room. And there's standards for that. It's 0 0.23 hours per minute of recovery room time to 2.25. But the pre-op process, the pre-admission testing, the pre-op process, and secondary recovery generally are kind of a mystery out there. And, and I've, I've worked with hospitals to try and establish a standard by putting all three of those areas together and coming out with a standard hours per patient for that part of the process because the pre-op testing and interview generally takes anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes depending on the age of the patient, whether they have English as a second language, if, they're, if they are on a lot of prescription medications and have a lot of comorbidities. Those patients are going to take longer to get ready. 
then pre-op the day of surgery. Again, those patients are probably going to take more time to get prepped and ready for surgery. But generally speaking, most patients can be prepped and ready to go into the OR in 60 minutes or less. And you also have to take into account that the nurses that are caring for that patient generally have a staffing ratio of two patients that they're caring for. That's why you see that the pre-op process, a lot of patients are coming in two hours prior to the start of surgery, so that nurse can get two patients done prior to the 7.30 start time. So, So really, in terms of the workload, that nurse is spending one hour with each patient, right? So it's it's one half to one hour in pre-admission testing and one half to one hour in the pre-op department. So that's anywhere from one to two hours between PAT and pre-op. Then when you add the secondary recovery phase to that, because usually the outpatients will go back to the pre-op area, those patients can stay there anywhere from one to five, six hours, depending on the procedure that they had and how long the surgeon wants to observe them, etc. So, again, it could be anywhere, and usually the staffing ratio on the post-op site is one to three. So, that's the, that's the ASPAN standard. So, for every hour that that patient's in the post-op site, it should be, theoretically, about 20 minutes. So, I usually try to tell hospitals that they need to be anywhere between 3.2 and 4.5 hours per patient for those three areas combined. And it, it depends on case mix, type of patient cases they're doing and what their volume is. So, Okay, let me ask you to clarify something just to make sure I understood it. You said three, like 3.5 hours per you mean employee hours? How many hours are worked by an employee for that particular patient that they're taking care of? That's right. Right. So so typically then, a nurse that's working in one of those units should be able to take care of three to four patients in a day, right? Well, I've, I've been in, in pre-op, post-op units where a nurse is only taking care of one or two patients in a day because they're run inefficiently. So there's, there's, there's methods to changing the process and making it more efficient. We might have to save that for another episode down the road. That was my question. <laughs> I was going to ask you, tell us what those methods are. So, Paul, the time always goes by quickly, but I bet it's a different experience for you being a guest on the show instead of being a host. Yeah. Maybe just give us, as we kind of you know come to a close here, some best practices for improving productivity. So instead of breaking down all these methods... Um, you know, maybe just some, some tips that people can look around and say, are we doing this? Are we not doing this? And kind of do a health check. You don't like my questions. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, you know, here, here, here's, here's what I would like to say about that. Generally speaking, it's not one or two things that you can look at and say, oh, this is where I need to improve the productivity. Generally speaking, especially in the operating room, generally speaking, it's a number of small things that accumulate to create the issue with productivity. And that's why I hesitated a little bit to answer that question because it really takes some thorough vetting and, and especially because when you're the one working in that environment, you don't always see it because you know, it's the way you've always done it. As a consultant, when somebody says, well, we've always done it that way, that's music to my ears because I know that's probably where there's an opportunity to look at a process and, and maybe make a change. But it's also the hardest thing to get people to change those processes if they've always done it that way. So. All right, Paul, as we wrap up here, what are some 
maybe final thoughts or something that we didn't cover during the interview that you think, you know, is really important to leave the listeners with. And obviously they can always, you know, reach out to us with questions. You're about as accessible as it gets on the first case podcast in terms of guests, but what would you, what would you leave the audience with today? I would say get to know what your standard is and how your hospital came up with it. How did they determine what's included and what's excluded? And if you see a change in your case mix, or if there are things that are changing, go after it. You know, if you've got the data, you should be able to prove that things need to change and be an advocate for yourself and your department. Make them prove to you that they're taking everything into consideration as they, as they develop your standard. All right, Paul. Well, thanks for sharing your insights today and every day here on the First Case Podcast. I know you're not going to be the first host of the show that's going to also be a guest, but I do appreciate you being the first one to take the leap versus all of us sort of introducing ourselves on episode one. So nice job today, Paul. Obviously, you have a wealth of experience. That's why we invited you to the show. And I'm sure everybody out there really appreciates you just being willing to share that knowledge and that experience experience. Well, well, thanks, Justin. You know, I'm, I'm very passionate about productivity. And for me, the key thing is the patient comes first, no matter what. And even when I had bonuses riding on meeting my productivity standard in, in a department, I never once changed what needed to be staffed in order to meet patient safety and there were many times when I never got my bonus, believe me, most of the time I didn't. But it was because I think it's important to make sure that the patient gets the best of care and your staff gets the best of care. They need to be treated fairly too, you know, so I think it's really important. And that was our very own Paul Wafer here at First Case, sharing a great deal of experience. And Melanie, I feel bad Paul didn't get his bonus most of the time, but I do feel very good that we picked a great co-host to be on this show for the fact that clearly his ethical center is right online. It's about increasing that productivity, but not necessarily making the kinds of sacrifices that ultimately destroy morale. And then you have to bring in a consultant to swing the pendulum back the other way because you did so much damage, whether it was intentional or not. And so again, just that that moral compass or that center on what's the right thing for the right situation. So key. So I really enjoyed today's episode. I'm sure you did as well. I did. And I think there's, there's a fine line to thread that needle between what's productive for the department and how you take care of your staff and making sure that you keep that balance. But I know a lot of times, unless you're in leadership for staff, understanding what productivity is, is kind of like, figuring out what magic is. How do they get that number? How do they come up with what's productive and what's not? So I think it was helpful just to have Paul break it down and to talk about it and kind of understand more what's going into the thought process behind productivity and how ultimately even productivity is helping us take care of our patients. All right, that's going to do it for this week's show. And as a reminder, you can help support First Case by subscribing on Apple, Amazon, or Google Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or on your favorite podcast application. You can also access bonus content for certain episodes by downloading our smartphone app for iPhone and Android. We'd certainly appreciate a rating and a review because your feedback is important to the show. And on behalf of Jeremy, Melanie, Paul, and myself, thank you for listening to this week's episode of First Case. We'll be right back. 